But the problem is that collateral, which is very high quality, it moves very slowly. <laughs> because when I want to post it as collateral or move it, or when I want to lend against it, those options are not available. Regulated yield-bearing assets move with stablecoin-like speed and flexibility. My understanding was that maybe there was, there was some rhyme or reason as to why we had a break in settlement. Welcome back to The Rope. This is your home to learn from the biggest guests, the brightest minds at the tip of innovation. Our goal is to help spread the collective knowledge of everyone in our community. We are breaking crypto out of its echo chamber and taking it to the real world. All right, guys, we got Carlos Domingo in the back. We're going Money Moves Fast, episode number two, powered by Polygon. We're talking Securitize. We're talking Buildle. We're talking RLUSD. And let's set the stage a little bit as, as, as we get Carlos up. So, Rob, as I was telling you, I'll shoot you this announcement as well. Um... Basically, Securitize is partnering with Ripple to enable RLUSD transfers for BlackRock's Buildle and BanX VBIL, which are two of the largest tokenized funds uh, in the world, uh, Securitize being number one. Um, they gain 24-7 instant exchange via RLUSD powered by Securitize. Um, you know, Rob, this is the Money Moves Fast show, talking payments, talking RWAs. Um, you know, Ripple has really tried to grow their ecosystem outside of just the uh, kind of core chain that they've had, bringing DeFi and more. Um, you know, this is this is a, a a moment for Securitize where basically they they have this RL USD backed one to one by USD deposits and short term treasuries issued under an NYDFS trust charter uh, with seven with seven hundred forty million dollars in circulation. RLUSD is purpose built for institutional use and now DeFi composability. So um, let's get Carlos up on stage now and let's get him up and let's get firing. All right, Carlos, welcome to Money Moves Fast, episode number two. Thank you for your patience and it's good to have you on, man. Good, good seeing you again, guys. How is everything? Congratulations for the Calci partnership, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It was very timely. Thank you, man. We talked about prediction markets last week. So Yeah, we did. Yes, we did. That was a good yeah. cross And we talked about the whole price dis price discovery that's happening in this new asset class. And it really feels like it could be an RWA. Some of the the, the lines in over which you draw some of these things, you know, we can re we can reclassify. And I really do think that if we're looking at the outcomes of certain events, you could maybe not real world, future world, you can you can make an argument for it. Good. All yeah. right. Let's talk uh, RLUSD then. Yeah, Carlos. So maybe you can break down this announcement today for us. You guys have rolled this out with Vanek. Kind of what's the story behind this and why is this important for Securitize? Good. So obviously for RWAs, to, one of the advantages that they have is that being on chain, uh, you have within the same ledger, you represent securities, which are the RWAs that we issue that represent a security, an LP interest on a fund or, or tokenized treasury fund or whatever it is. But then you have tokenized dollars as well, right? And then one of the issues with capital markets is that the dollar, the, the rails for the dollars and the rails for the securities are disconnected. So one of the huge advantages of tokenization is that you bring within the same ledger technology, tokenized securities and tokenized dollars, they can interact with each other in a, in a native way and in an atomic way, right? And that it's a huge thing because it reduces, you know, settlement time, friction, counterparty risk, etc. Like people don't realize that when you go on Robinhood and you buy shares, you're actually not getting the shares, right? There is a whole process behind the scenes of settling to move the shares, move the cash, etc. That takes uh, two days, it actually takes two days, believe it or not. Um, but on chain, those things can be done atomic. Right, because you have a token representing a security, a token representing a, a, a dollar, which is a stable coin. So for us, being uh, you know the largest issuer of tokenized securities, we need to partner with the largest issuers of tokenized dollars because that's how we bring the two worlds together and provide liquidity for our assets, which is hugely important to make them you know more useful for people on chain. Uh, you know, being able to then compose them better with DeFi that needs liquidation, use them as collateral for trading. Uh, in case the collateral needs to get liquidated, you need to exit into stable coins, etc. So, um, as you know, Ripple, uh, one of the largest companies in the space, launched its own stable coin. I believe it was like six months ago or something like that, like pretty recently. Yeah. But it's been pretty remarkable how quick, how big it has become so quickly. So obviously, Ripple is a company very familiar to us. They, I don't know if people are aware of it, but they invested in our company in 2018, and we've always been. 
you know, talking to them. Um, but more recently, I think Ripple has started like kind of doing some movements to get closer to our space. They, as you know, launched a custody product. Now they, they bought a prime broker and now they launched a stable coin. So, so that led to the discussions of why don't we use our USD as one of the liquidity layers for uh, RWAs and then the announcement today that we're going to start that with the two tokenized uh, treasury funds that we have, uh, Biddle from BlackRock and Vivil from uh, from Banek, where well, they will have instant on-chain liquidity options into our LUSD. So that's uh, that's the the announcement that we've made today. Yeah, Carlos, this is Money Moves Fast episode two. This is a perfect announcement for this because. In the copy for the announcement, you guys wrote regulated yield bearing assets move with stablecoin like speed and flexibility. And one of the big concepts that we're trying to get across here is that there are a lot of advantages to using blockchain rails to tokenize assets and, and provide that 24 seven kind of instant experience that anybody who uses crypto is now very familiar with and frankly used to. Maybe you can talk to the to the impact of having regulated yield bearing assets moving with the flexibility and speed that we're used to in the crypto space, what that unlocks and kind of what are the second and third order effects potentially of having these regulated yield bearing assets at, you know, at breakneck speed uh, globally. So look, I, I was talking the other day to the, the founder of CEO of a very, very large trading firm. I'm not going to mention the name just for <laughs> a, a personal conversation, but he was telling me something very interesting because this firm does both trading traditional and, and crypto. And he said, look, in, in traditional markets, I have very high quality collateral because I get money market funds uh, from like BlackRock or JP Morgan, whatever, that are high quality because they're regulated. They have a, a, a predictable yield because obviously being a regulated asset, you have to fully disclose what are the fees, uh, you know, what the yield is going to be. You can't just change it discretionary. Um, and then, but the problem is that collateral, which is very high quality, it moves very slowly. <laughs> Because when I want to post it as collateral or move it, or when I want to lend against it during the weekend, etc., those options are not available because markets move at the speed they move, and sometimes they are closed, etc. I said in crypto, people tend to use you know either crypto assets or stable coins to post as collateral, which move very fast, right? Because you basically just send it and it's there and they liquidate it and it disappears, uh, uh, etc. But but then you have you know you don't have like high quality regulated yield bearing assets where you have a, a, a clear expectation of the of the return of course stablecoin providers do all sort of like uh reward sharing and stuff like that but it's kind of all <laughs> not official behind it's all behind the scenes because stable coins by by definition they're not yield bearing right so so i think that you know tokenized treasuries like like Beetle or vivil they kind of merge the best of both worlds right they give you the same high quality you know, assets that you have on TradeFi as collateral, but they move at the speed of stable coins. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, if they get liquidated, they need to be moved back into like digital dollars, right? Tokenized dollars. This is why integrating, uh, you know, tokenized treasury funds like uh, Bill and Vivil with stable coins like RLUSD is very critical for the whole, you know, uh, thing to work uh, properly. So, yeah. introducing Extended exclusively on Stark, a next gen perp trading platform live today. With 50 plus trading pairs from crypto to TradFi, you get the best experience on chain today. Deposit in the community vault for attractive returns, EMV compatible, and engage in unified margin spot trading, lending, and perps trading. Carlos, awesome. when you're thinking about the actual market segment of users and institutional adoption for these types of products that are tokenized on chain, and you're speaking to the uh, clientele, you know how how valuable are they ascribing these properties of what blockchain can bring to their current needs, right? We understand what it can do holistically, but when it comes to an institution's direct needs, you know, are they uh, ascribing certain value to the settlement, to the fast settlement, to the transfer speeds, to the uh, verifiability that blockchain brings? Like which of the core properties are they ascribing the most value to and then thus demanding the most out of kind of the, the core that we just talked about? I would say is, is a bit of all of the above, right? <laughs> so obviously, they like that the assets are high quality. They like that they are on chain, so they're verifiable. Like if you're using, you know, Biddle as the backing of your stable coin, you can actually verify the the, the reserves on chain, right? Because it's visible on chain. People can actually trust your stable coin or any other asset that you're creating using, uh, you know, an RWA because you can actually see it 
uh, on chain. So the, the, the verifi verifiability of the holdings is important. The fact that it's very fast transferable, peer to peer, etc., is very important as well. And then the fact that you know they have liquidity, right? Like if they need to, you know, liquidate a collateral or liquidate a reserve because you know a stablecoin gets, uh, you know, uh, redemptions, etc. The fact that you can move it out uh, from the RWA into stablecoins that obviously are more liquid uh, on chain uh, is a huge um, advantage. So I don't know. I don't think that obviously everybody has their own use cases, and some people value more one feature than the other one. But I think that the combination of all these features is what makes RWA so powerful, right? Yeah, yeah, Carlos. I'm I'm curious about the the settlement time that you did, that you mentioned. M my understanding was that maybe there was there was some rhyme or reason as to why we had a break in settlement. You know why these things took a day, or you know why the market is only open you know nine to four. Is it to mark to market to rebalance the index funds? Is there any rhyme or reason, or was it just an antiquated system just didn't have the technology? To, to so in some cases, the, the fact that people in traditional markets don't use instant settlement is because they want to do net settlement, right? So, so there is a component of, you know, do net settlement so it doesn't require cash moving in and out all the time because you only settle at the end of the day. But, you know, you could you can have that with like a T plus one if you want or T plus mm -hmm. two hours or T plus five hours. The fact that it's T plus two, and by the way, it was T plus three before or T plus whatever before, right? So, so the markets are, are becoming more efficient, but but the fact that they don't settle faster, uh, and faster doesn't necessarily mean instant, <laughs> because okay. you want to have net settlement and you don't want instant settlement. But the fact that they don't settle faster is a pure uh, technology issue, because markets are antiquated. And then market hours is also a, a, a you know it's a construct, right? Like there is no necessarily any regulation. In fact, there's some uh, you know securities today in Robinhood and other platforms that they trade twenty four seven. Of course, they have less liquidity, but they, they still could trade 24 seven, right? There's no regulation that prohibits you to, you know, trade a stock at, uh, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's a market construct, how markets were created uh, back in the days. So I think these things will evolve ultimately, especially with blockchain coming to the picture, you will see 24 seven markets like crypto uh, becoming the norm for every asset class, uh, tokenized or not tokenized, so. Yeah, Carlos, I'm curious what the word on the street is about the upcoming rise of these payment chains. Uh, RLUSD with Ripple is obviously growing almost to a billion dollars of supply for their stablecoin. Ripple has been the one of the largest payments networks, you know, in general, uh, you know, for the last ten years. You've got you know chains like uh, Polygon. You've got chains like Solana, and then now you've got the rise of Plasma, Tempo, Arc stable and these types what is the word on the street about the rise of these payments chains um and kind of how are you viewing this landscape of the of the payments chains competition holistically from securitize that's a good question i think that is i don't know how this is gonna end um i mean for for a pure payment chain you could argue that some of the existing chains are actually already good enough for payments because they maybe ethereum is not the best payment term because of you know it, it prioritizes security above anything else, and therefore you know the settlement times are not adequate for payments where you want as instant as possible. So I can see why you need a payment chain, but the fact that every stablecoin holder or uh, is launching its own chain is just because they're trying to corner the market there uh, for their own benefit, right? So um, so which one will prevail? I don't know. But what is very clear becoming in this industry is that this is not going to be uh, a single blockchain industry. This will be a collection of multiple blockchains that will have to try the specific features for particular use cases. And then the question to me is, how do you make interoperability across chains uh, more seamless and with a better experience, right? Because today, yes, you can bridge things from one chain or another, but if you guys have tried ever, it's a pretty clunky experience. <laughs> so so for consumers, ultimately, you don't want to deal with that there is a blockchain out there. Right? It's like the same with internet, right? Like in the past, you had to download the CPIP software and you know a modern software and connect. and today you use internet and you don't even know that you're connected to a network of networks right because internet is also not a monolithic network right so networks are interconnected and it makes it completely seamless for the end users so i think that we need to get to the point where if we end up in a situation where we have a hundred different blockchains for different use cases that work well for some assets or some other asset classes etc that this becomes completely transparent for the end user because yeah. all of this we're going to be creating big problems from a user experience perspective one one quick follow up there for you, and then I know we're coming up on time. Is 
you know, we, we had Jeremy Allaire on last week and he spoke about how USCC is trying to be everywhere, right? In the same lens that Netflix is now on your TV, on your iPad, on your, you know, even on, on your smart fridge or on your bathroom mirror, they want to get USCC everywhere. And he used the, the analogy of, you know, you can use Google Chrome on your MacBook, on your Apple device. You can use Apple TV on Samsung TVs, on LG TVs, on Sony TVs. He really kind of explained how when he's th thinking about this kind of payments landscape he's thinking about it in this lens of growing the pie versus kind of like seeing a singular kind of uh, square into a circular whole type of of format from securitizer's perspective it would seem to me that you guys benefit from a wider more uh you know more uh kind of holistic environment of different chains with more breadth, uh, you know, each of them having their own depth. Kind of from the securitized perspective, do you do you agree with this analogy for where you see some of the stable coins and payments heading as far as their interoperability? And how does that impact the securitized business kind of vision and and broader direction? Yeah, I don't. I don't know about uh, you know what's the 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 vision of Circle versus other of the people building their chains. It's very clear to me though that you know uh, in some of these cases, and not when I mention any specifically, they're just trying to create their own payment network, right? They, so right. the same way that Visa and Mastercard has its own payment network, I do definitely think from our perspective that we want to be everywhere as well, right? Like I don't want to have a you know talking about, uh, tokenized money market fund that only works on this chain. Like if there's a Another chain that takes off and has enough liquidity, users, uh, stable coins, etc. We want to be there, and we're integrated currently. I think with like fifteen different uh, blockchains, a combination of L ones and, and L twos. So, so yes, for for us, uh, you know, working with as many chains as possible uh, is definitely the the goal and what we've been doing uh, so far. And yes, to some extent, the more if this new blockchains just increase the pie, as uh, you said, Jeremy was saying the other day, so more people consume. Uh, stable coins, I believe more people will consume tokenized assets, right? Because it's kind of kind of the natural next step after you start trying stable coins to, to try to do all the things with the infrastructure. So. Well, I hope your uh, perps versus prediction markets panel went well, Carlos. One final thing. <laughs> Here's for a lot of fun, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> what is the work that you're doing with Polygon on the RWA and tokenization side? They've been growing significantly. Maybe you can talk, talk to us a bit about securitized relationship there and what you guys have been building. Well, we've been friends of the Polygon team for a very, very long time. Uh, obviously, you know, Mark very well and Sandeep and, and many of the of the people there. I do believe they were like the, the second, like the, the second time we did like a major project with an asset manager was with Polygon and, and Hamilton Lane. Uh, so we're fully integrated with them. We've deployed many assets. Uh, we, you know, talk a lot uh, uh, with the teams. We like the, the technology. And, and as I mentioned, it was our second Kind of a third, if you, if you take Ethereum outside, but um, uh, of where we deploy assets and and we continue being very excited about all the progress they're making. Carlos, one last question from my side. You, you mentioned uh, really really late. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the la last thing, uh, just real quick, is that you know you, you guys have your own chain and converge. You, you work with a lot of chains and, and several asset managers. Well, how do you think about your own chain relative to this broader landscape of chains that you work with? Yeah, I don't want you to think of Converge of our own chain, right? This is something we've uh, spearheaded uh, and uh, in collaboration with, with Athena. It's, it's purposely has a separate name and because we, as I mentioned, we don't want to have our own chain where our assets live. We want to work with all the chains and we partner with all the uh, chains and, and foundations. We just think that, you know, there's a space for innovation um, that, you know, is, uh, where in, is in particular in the, in the topic of how you you know, bring RWS integrated with DeFi. Um, <clears throat> that that you know, there's room for innovation there. But uh, but I kind of agree with what uh, Andy said that Jeremy was saying that the purpose is to increase the pie, not just to you know create a uh, a close ecosystem for for our assets. Our assets, I want them to be in as many places as possible. Carlos Domingo, CEO of Securitize. Thank you for your time. Great work in the space. Congratulations. Sorry for all the technical problems we had today. Thank you, Carlos, for coming on. Thank you. Bye bye.